you for this great truth that you are coming. And when you come, what we just sung about will, will come into full reality for all of us who have believed in you. And our prayer is that you would come soon. Lord, this morning as we consider another truth that is connected with your coming, another truth that will occur at the end of this age, we ask that you would give us help to understand this truth. It is something we all struggle with. It is something we all fear. And we pray, Lord, that as we look in the text of your word this morning, that you will give us understanding and that you will use the imagery of this text to impact us, to transform us, and to compel us to do your will as it pertains to the judgment to come. So we give you now our hearts, our minds, our ears. We ask for your help, the help of the Spirit. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Please be seated. So this morning we're in Revelation chapter, well, chapters 14 through 16. There is a portion of chapter 14 and 15 that we have already considered. But this morning we want to look at this broad sweep in the book of Revelation because there's a dominant theme uh, that occurs in it. And uh, what I want to do is read to you um, a number of verses. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to hop around in Revelation 14 through 16 at the moment. Uh, the majority of our time will be spent in chapter 16, but I want you to see that what is thematic in 16 really begins in 14 and carries all the way through. So let me uh, point out a number of verses and just make a few comments as I read. Follow me, please. Revelation 14, you do need your Bibles this morning. Revelation 14, verse 9. I want you, want you to see something interesting in each of these verses that I'll make reference to. Verse 9, 14, 9. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury. Now, let's just stop there before we finish the sentence. Uh, I want you to just picture in your mind. You, do you have a mental image of fury? I don't mean Nick Fury, agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., but fury, God's fury. Can, can, can you just picture that in your mind? Fury. Have you seen someone who's angry before? Fury. It's a word we don't normally use to describe anger, but there it is. The wine of God's fury, which has been poured full into the strength, full strength, into the cup of his wrath. Now picture that word with fury. Of course, the meaning is very similar, but just picture that in your mind. Someone who's furious, someone who's filled with wrath. Now go down to um, chapter 14, verse 19. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. It's, uh, it's not a pretty picture that is being described there. There it is, God's wrath, the great winepress of God's wrath. Now chapter 15, verse 1. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. God's wrath is completed. We'll come back to that phrase later this morning. It's an important one, particularly the word completed. Now go to chapter 15, verse 7. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So picture that. You've got seven angels now. They have these huge bowls. Picture them holding the bowls like this. And it's as though they come to the edge of heaven and they tilt forward and out of those bowls comes all kinds of stuff, bad stuff. It's, these bowls are filled with the wrath of God. Chapter 16, verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. 
Now, a different word is used in verse 5, but it conveys the same meaning. Uh, these, this is the angel in charge of the waters. This happens when the third bowl is poured out. And this angel proclaims, you are just in these judgments. There's the word, judgments. You who are and who were the Holy One because you have so judged. Wrath, fury, judge, or judgments. Now go to chapter 16, verse 19. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. This is universal. It happens throughout the world. God remembered Babylon the Great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. So both fury and wrath, again, used in the same sentence, the fury of his wrath. So these recurring words through the passage enable us to understand, to see immediately what the theme here is. And so this morning's message is entitled, God's Wrath Completed, uh, with a subtitle, Reflections on Judgment. And that's exactly what I want to do this morning. I want to reflect with you uh, on the judgment of God. If we could get the title up on the screen, please. Now, uh, before you start reading that, just the, uh, isn't the, okay, let's, let's just wait on that for a moment. Yeah, thank you. Um, most of us, if you're like me, um, you have a hard time uh, with the word wrath. It's a word we don't want to use. We don't want to hear about it. Uh, we would rather avoid it. Um, we, we'd love to push it aside. Uh, some of us would like to believe it's not even in the Bible. Uh, we quoted this morning from the Apostles' Creed. And when we got to the end of the statement on Jesus, the last line is, he will come to do what? To judge the living and the dead. And the Apostles' Creed was composed a long time ago, well over 1,500 years back, longer than that actually. And so for all of these years, the Christian church in its various forms and the liturgy of the church has repeated the Apostles' Creed. And the church has affirmed its belief that when Jesus Christ returns to this earth, he will judge the living and the dead. Now, some of you have an idea of God that goes something like this. We hear this a lot today. Uh, well, yeah, the Bible talks about God being a God of judgment and a God of wrath, but that's the Old Testament God. And the God of the New Testament who comes to us in Jesus is completely different. The God of the New Testament is not the same as the God of the Old Testament. Have you heard that before? I hear it a lot. And I'm going to, listen, some of you have that kind of mindset. The God of the Old Testament is a God who's all angry and he's filled with wrath and he's a judging God. But the God of the New Testament is a God who would never, ever judge the world. He's full of love. We see that in Jesus, don't we? The problem with that thinking is that it's not just the Old Testament that speaks about the wrath of God. The New Testament does too. Now some of you say, well, yeah, of course, Revelation, John, that's where we've been the last few weeks. But it's not just the book of Revelation. The judgment of God, the wrath of God, is found in every New Testament book. So we need to eradicate from our thinking this dichotomy that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New. Listen, the God of the New Testament who comes to us in Jesus Christ is the God of the Old Testament. One God. One God. I think what happens for us is we misunderstand the term wrath, the word wrath, because of our experiences as human beings. There are probably a number of us here this morning, and you have had a very negative experience with someone who's filled with fury, filled with wrath. It may have been someone very close to you. It may have happened to you when you were a child. And when we think of judgment or wrath, we, we, we have in our minds a negative, abusive context. And so we just push this aside, or we misunderstand what the Bible says concerning it. So it's very important that we define what we mean by God's judgment or God's wrath 
what the Apostle John means, because here it is, it keeps occurring in this text that we have read this morning. Let me just say a couple of comments, and then I want to read to you a very long quote, um, which is very, very helpful. But let me just say this to preface my comments before this quote, as preface comments before this quote. When we talk of the love of the, the wrath of God, we are not talking about an intense, emotional, uncontrolled a flare up on God's part, where God just kind of loses it. And he goes, he goes ballistic. No, no, that's not what we're talking about. We are not talking about some kind of irrational passion that was very similar to the gods of ancient myth where they just wanted to do people in whenever they had a chance. We're not speaking of something capricious or something unwarranted. So the quote I want to read to you comes from Dr. J.I. Packer, who for many years was a professor of theology at the Regent College in Vancouver. And this comes from his book, Knowing God. It's a book that we have in our, li our library. A number of you have read that book. Now, I normally would not give a lengthy quote of this nature in a message, but this quote is so helpful and so explanatory that I want to read it to you this morning. God's wrath in the Bible is something which men choose for themselves. That's an important line. They choose it for themselves. Before hell is an experience inflicted by God, it is a state for which man himself opts. By retreating from the light which God shines in his heart to lead him to himself. When John, that is John the Apostle, writes in the Gospel of John, he who does not believe, that is in Jesus, is condemned or judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God, he goes on to explain himself as follows. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. He means just what he says. The decisive act of judgment upon the lost is the judgment which they pass upon themselves by rejecting the light that comes to them in and through Jesus Christ. In the last analysis, all that God does subsequently in judicial action towards the unbeliever, whether in this life or beyond it, is to show him and lead him into the full implications of the choice he has made. The unbeliever has preferred to be by himself, without God, defying God, having God against him, and he shall have his preference. Nobody stands under the wrath of God except those who have chosen to do so. The essence of God's action in wrath is to give men what they choose. We need, therefore, to remember that the key to interpreting the many biblical passages which picture the divine king and judge as active against men in wrath and vengeance is to realize that what God is hereby doing is no more than to ratify and confirm judgments which those whom he visits have already passed on themselves by the course they have chosen to follow. This reminds me of, a, um, of something that C.S. Lewis said in one of his books, where Lewis says, there are only two kinds of people in the world. There are those who pray, your will be done, and there are those to whom God will say, your will be done. Leon Morris, um, who is an uh, Australian common commentator, I think gives a good definition of the wrath of God. He defines the wrath of God as God's strong and settled opposition to all that is evil that rises out of God's very nature. God's wrath is a burning zeal for the right coupled with a perfect hatred for everything that is evil. Now let's look at chapter 14 through 16 this morning a little bit, well, more closely than we have thus far. I think you would agree with me as you see the repetition of the words fury and wrath. You see here, and I see in this passage, how serious God is about right and wrong, about good and evil. So what I want to do this morning, it's a little different from what we've done in the past, is I want to make a number of initial observations based on this text, 
Then I want to, um, then I want to talk briefly uh, about what this means for us today. And finally, I want us to see at the end of the message that this text, this passage, which is filled with the wrath of God, is actually good news. Let me say that again. This text, which is filled with the wrath of God, is actually the gospel, the good news. So, observation number one. The vision that we have in Revelation 14 through 16, particularly the outpouring of the seven bowls in Revelation chapter 16, is full of rich symbolism. Now, I've been saying this all through this, this uh, series, uh, but it needs to be underscored one more time. I don't think that God wants us to think that there is coming a day, an actual day, when there are going to be literally seven angels who literally have seven bowls who pour out those bowls on the earth. I don't think that's what's being said here. Rather, I think the imagery of angels holding bowls and pouring the contents of those bowls out on the earth is just simply a rich, symbolic way of telling us how horrible it's going to be. It's depicting for us the awful reality of judgment. Now, don't misquote, quote, quote me. Don't go from here and say that I didn't say it, that I believe in the judgment of God. I do believe in the judgment of, of God, but I believe the rich symbolism of the text is simply there to, to, to impact our imaginations and to help us to see how horrible it is. If I say to you, God is going to judge the world, period, you say, okay, fine. But if I begin to explain to you, using the language of this text, what that judgment is going to look like, what it feels like, it captures your imagination in a different way. So John, through this apocalyptic imagery that is employed here in the text, he's getting our attention. He is going beyond our intellect, through our emotions, and into our imaginations to impact us in a powerful way. And so the imagery, the symbolism of the text, actually enhances the truth of the horror of the judgment of God. Number two, the setting of this vision is very, very important. Here's what I want you to notice. Chapter 15, verse 5. Before the judgments are poured out, we have this introduction statement in verse 5. After this I looked. And in heaven, the temple, that is, the tabernacle of testimony was opened. Opened. That is a key word. There are four times that something is opened in this book. The first one we saw a number of months back in Revelation chapter 4, where John says, I saw heaven opened, and there before me was a throne. Heaven was open, and we see that God is in control of all things. The next occurrence of this phrase is in chapter 11, where the temple is opened, and in the temple, John sees the ark, the covenant, it's there, and then John has a vision of this horrific battle, this horrific war of a, a dragon pursuing the woman. The third time we see this phrase is right here in chapter 15, verse 5. And the last time we will see heaven being opened is in chapter 19, verse 11, when Jesus Christ pulls back the veil, as it were. John says, I saw heaven opened, and Jesus Christ returns to the earth as a conquering king. So there's something very significant. Look at, again at verse 5. After this I looked, and in heaven the temple that is the tabernacle of testimony was opened. Interesting phrases. The tabernacle of testimony, which is the temple. Now, why is John saying this? What, what is John up, up to, or what's happening? What is John seeing? Two things, I think, need to be underscored on this second point. The tabernacle of testimony in the Old Testament days was the place where the tablets of stone were contained. Tablets of stone, what do, you, what do you mean? The tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments had been written upon. They were contained within the tabernacle. Now notice, it is called the tabernacle of testimony. So the tabernacle is testifying. 
There's something the tabernacle is saying. The tabernacle is witnessing to a truth. And the truth is, the Ten Commandments are contained inside. So the tabernacle of testimony is testifying, witnessing to this truth of the abiding demands of God's law. God's law, His Ten Commandments, are eternal. They do not change depending on what happens in humanity and in history. They are just as valid and just as binding upon humanity as they were when they were originally given to the prophet Moses. So the bowls, the outpouring of these bowls is connected to the fact of God's moral law. The bowls are being poured out in wrath, in judgment, on an unbelieving, unrepentant world because the bowls are the natural consequences of violating God's commandments. Now, the tabernacle of testimony is also significant because it was here that people had their meeting with the living God. That is why the tabernacle of testimony in some Old Testament passages is referred to as the tent of meeting. This was the tabernacle, the tent that, that, that the priests would function in and where the worship of Israel would occur before Israel finally arrived in the promised land and was able to build a permanent edifice, which is, as we know, the temple. This is where God met with his people. And as I said, it is called the tent of meeting in Exodus, in, Deut in Deuteronomy, and in other places. Now, here's the important point. Because it was the place where people would meet with God, we often read that God's presence came on the tabernacle, and God's presence was in it as well. And so we have a verse, for example, in Exodus 40, which says, the glory of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, filled the tabernacle. So what is John telling us here? It is there at the tent of meeting that God's essential character is both revealed and experienced by God's ancient people. It is there at the tabernacle of testimony that God's holiness, His burning zeal for everything that is right, coupled with His perfect hatred of everything that is evil, was revealed and experienced by God's people. So the outpouring of these bowls onto the earth is nothing more than the natural automatic reflex of the holiness of God. It is the logical response of God's holiness to all that is evil and impure. Now chapter 16, 15 verse 6 tells us, Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven, uh, with the seven plagues. Now notice how the angels are described. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. Now what is interesting about these angels who have the bowls of God's wrath is their description is identical to the description of Jesus in chapter 1 where John sees Jesus glorified for the first time. Jesus is dressed in fine linen and he has a golden sash around his chest. This means that these angels are mediators of Jesus. They are mediating the judgment of the living Jesus Christ to the world. They are dressed in fine linen because the judgment that they pour out in these bowls is a judgment, a wrath that is pure, a wrath that is sinless. Now that's different than human judgment and wrath. It is priestly in function. It is golden in the integrity of the wrath. In other words, there is no animal-like passion here. There is nothing being done in, to spite or to hate or in the anger of sin. And that is the setting of the outpouring of these bowls. And this setting is important because it tells us the awful judgment that emerges, emerges from the holy presence and character of God himself. Observation number three. These seven bowls are related to the previous seven visions that we have seen in the book. A period of previous visions of seven. Now, if you are just joining us today and haven't been a part of this series and have not read through the book of, Rev of Revelation, 
you probably won't understand what this point means. What we're referring to, so let me help, help, help you. In Revelation, there are three series of seven judgments that come. The first is seven seals. Uh, don't, don't think of the, an, a seal as being an animal. We're talking about seals on a scroll, okay? Seven seals on a large scroll. These picture seals of wax. And each one of these seals is broken off the scroll. And every time a seal is broken, what is written on the scroll, which contains the purpose of God, it contains the plan of God, it, compl- it, con- it contains history and how God is going to make history work to its preordained end. When those seals are broken, history begins to happen. Things begin to happen on the earth. Judgment comes. Then we have seven trumpets that are blown, and that's found in Revelation chapter 8 through 11. And the angels who blow those trumpets are blowing trumpets of warning. It is warning to the world. Seven seals are broken, seven trumpets are sounded, and now we come to seven bowls which are poured out. Now, how then are the seven seals and the seven trumpets related to the seven bowls? Now, there are some people who say that it's just simply a historical sequence of events. Uh, This is just chronological order. First, you will have the seven seals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven events. Then you will have seven trumpets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven events. Then finally, you will have seven bowls. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven discernible, specific events in history that will occur. So in total, 21 different events of the judgment of God. I don't believe that this is an accurate way to read this book. I don't believe that that's what the purpose of the imagery is. I prefer to look at this as three go-arounds. In other words, the first seven seals is the first go-around of the judgments of God. The seven trumpets is the second time around. And the outpouring of seven bowls is the third time around. They're all referring to the same thing, but they're referring to them in different ways. In other words, it is a different perspective on the judgment of God that happens each time, but all about the same reality. And I think that's clear when you look at, for example, the first trumpet sounds and it's judgment that comes on the earth. But when the, the first bowl is poured out, it's judgment that comes at the same place on the earth. When the second trumpet sounds, it's judgment on the sea. When the second bowl is poured out, it's judgment on the sea. And if you follow the judgments through, you will see that each time they're referring to the same place. So the perspective is different then. To put it in this way, the seven seals give us the perspective of the church of Jesus Christ. We're here in the world. We're experiencing all of this. We may not be under the wrath of God, but we are living in a world that is. And so we have a different perspective, so to speak, on what is happening when God pours his judgments out on the earth. The second then, which is the seven trumpets, gives us the perspective of the world. A world that God is calling to repent, but a world that refuses to do so. And so then finally, the seven bowls, we get the perspective of God himself. We get the perspective of the throne of God and of the temple of God. This leads us to the fourth observation. John here is using a literary technique which we call recapitulation. Now, so that means then that each series of seven visions starts at the beginning and it goes to the end. So from the beginning of this world, the beginning of this age, right to the end of the world when Christ comes to judge the world. And it happens over and over again. Recapitulation goes from the beginning to the end. From the beginning to the end. Now every time then, In these series of visions, you get to the seventh, you get to the end, and you expect that the end is going to come. That it is right at this point that that God, the next vision will be the new creation. We will see the new heaven and the new earth. We will come to the end of the story, and we will see the new thing that God is going to do. But that's not what happens. We go back to the beginning again every time we get to number seven. 
So with the breaking of the seven seals, it takes us all the way to chapter 8, verse 11, and right then, we're expecting the end of the world, and actually, it feels like the end. Because when you get to the, out, the breaking of the seventh seal in chapter 8, verse 11, it says there was silence in heaven for half an hour. It kind of feels like the end. Then the trumpets happen, and it takes you all the way to chapter 11, and we read that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. So you expect now, well, this is the end, and now we're going to see what that kingdom looks like. We're going to get a description of the kingdom of God. But you don't. It goes all the way back to the beginning again. And then you get the seven bowls, which leads us right through to chapter 16, verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. It's finished. Completed. At last. And so you expect that what you're going to see next then is, is the new creation. God's going to bring us a description now of the new heaven and the new earth. But that's not what happens. Because in chapter 17, which we'll look at next week, you go all the way back and you see another judgment of God that comes. And so there's this recapitulation that takes place from the beginning to the end. But it is not just a go-around. Not just a go-around. Because each time this happens in Revelation, some kind of progress is made. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's go back to the seven seals. When the seven seals are broken, it tells us repeatedly in chapters 6 through 8, 6 and 7, that it affects a third of the earth. One third. There's a fraction given. One third of the earth, one third of the sea, one third of the rivers, one third of humankind. And then it ends. So we go now to the beginning of the trumpets, the trumpets blast, and what happens now? It's one, sorry, did I say one-third on the first one? I meant to say one-fourth, okay? So just rewind the button, place in fourth. When you get to the seven trumpets, it's one-third, so the number gets increased. It affects one-third of the world, one-third of human, of human beings. But when you get here now to the bulls, there's no more fractions. We can put that up on the screen then. Seven seals, one-fourth, gives us a warning. Seven trumpets, one-third, warning, warning, warning. God's trying to get our attention. Seven bulls, no more fractions. And the description is total. There are no more warnings that are given. Now we come, point number five, observation five, to the contents of the bulls. Okay, and I'm going to try to move through this as rapidly as I, as I can here. Just a couple of brief comments on each of these things here. What I want you to see is that the imagery is intended to make us feel the horror of judgment and the horror of not repenting of our sin. The first one is found in verse 2. The first bowl is poured out. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land. And what was the judgment poured out? Ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Now with these painful sores that come on these people, I want you to notice this, that they come upon people who have chosen to side with evil. They have chosen to receive the mark of the beast. They have chosen to live in this world and to become inhabitants of this world and to be enmeshed in the way of this world. They have made their choice. They have sided with evil. They have sided with that which is in opposition to Jesus. The second bowl is poured out in verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood, like that of a dead man. And every living thing in the sea died. Now, why does it refer to blood here? Well, let's read verses 4 through 6, where we have the third bowl poured out on the rivers and the springs. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Now, this reminds us of what happened in Exodus, right? Remember? The river Nile turned into blood. So the imagery is being drawn from there. Verse 5, Then I heard the, and the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed what? What have they shed? The blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. 
You see that there? They are responsible for putting God's people to death, for persecuting the church. And because they have done so, they have shed blood, they receive blood. That's what's being said here. Verse 6 is an interesting verse, last line. As they deserve. In other words, the punishment fits the crime. You shed blood, you receive blood. That's what's being said here. Then we come to the fourth bowl, which is the sun. The fourth bowl, and that's found in verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over these plagues. But they refused to repent and to glorify him. The purpose of the, ju the, ju the judgment is to wake them up and bring them to repentance, but they go further and they curse God and the sun scorches them. Now contrast this with what is said in chapter 7. Go back to chapter 7. Keep your finger here, but just go back to chapter 7, verse 16. Because in chapter 7, verse 16, we have a picture of God's redeemed. Something is said about them, and it is the complete opposite of what happens to the people in chapter 7. 16. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. True only of those who are God's redeemed, not true of the world at large. We come now to the pouring out of the fifth bowl, and that is in verses 10 and 11, and here we read that the throne of the beast and his kingdom was plunged into dark, dark, darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of the pains and their sores but they refused to repent of what they had done. Again, they curse God, and they do not turn from their sin. And we'll read more about this in next week's message when we get into chapter 17 and 18 about the throne of the beast. Now what I want you to see is the sixth bowl is poured out in verse 12. And the sixth bowl affects the river Euphrates, a river that I think we're all familiar with. It's not, a, it's not a mystical river. It's an actual river. It's there in the Middle East. It's the river that divides the nation of Iraq and Iran to this very day. The, seventh, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Notice what happens. Its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the pro false prophet. They are the spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world. Notice this. The kings of the east now become who? The kings of the whole world. So the kings of the east is symbolic of the kings of the whole world. To gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Now, here's what I want you to see. This is a very complex image that is given here. But look at verse 12 again. Its water was dried up for what reason? To prepare the way. That's a key line. To prepare the way. For what? For the kings from the east. Now they're coming from the east, but where are they going? If you come from somewhere, you have to be heading somewhere. I think that the imagery that is being used here is used because it goes back to a fear that was prevalent in the days of the Roman M Empire of what lied beyond the river Euphra Euphrates. Rome had pretty much conquered most of the world. But when we say most of the world, we're talking about what we as Westerners would call the known world of that day. So all of North Africa, all of Southern Europe, all around into Asia, the Middle East, up to the river Euphrates. So the extremity, the extreme part of the Roman Empire was the river Euphrates. Beyond the Euphrates River lied the Parthian Empire. Now Rome was afraid of Parthia. And the reason was the, the garrisons that they had placed along the river Euphrates was the weakest defenses in the empire of Rome. And Rome had spread its army out all over Europe and North Africa. And they feared that if the Parthians came in strength, and cross the river that they would be able literally to march on Rome because Rome had scattered its forces all over the place. Coupled with this was the rumor that Nero had risen again from the dead. And it was believed in this myth 
that he had actually gone to Parthia and he was raising an army there to march on Rome to retake the empire of Rome again. So when John writes, the kings of the east are going to come across this river, Rome, the empire of Rome, is now in fear. And it is Rome, which was the Babylon of John's day, that is about to be judged. Verse 13 tells us that there were spirits that looked like frogs that came out of the mouth of the dragon, the false prophet, the beast. This is that evil trinity again. We have a picture of evil. Verse 14 says, they are the spirits of demons. They work miraculous signs. And what are they working those miraculous signs to do? To seduce the kings of the whole world. To gather them together for battle, the text tells us. So, we read now about this battle, or so-called battle. It's not much of a battle, really. Verse 16. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Have you heard that word before? Oh, all kinds of books and periodicals and everybody wants to write about Armageddon. We've been using this terminology in the modern age ever since the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan 60 years ago. The world is at the brink of Armageddon. Now it says here that the kings are gathered to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now, just a couple of facts then about this. First of all, there is no actual place called Armageddon. Armageddon is a Greek transliteration of Hebrew, and in Hebrew it's Har Megiddo. Har Megiddo. Har means mountain. It is the mountain of Megiddo. So the kings are gathered to the mountain of Megiddo. Now, 100 kilometers north of the city of Jerusalem, near Mount Carmel, is a place called Har Megiddo. But it's not a mountain. It's a plain, a vast plain. Now, interestingly, there was a battle there. And the battle is recorded for us in the Bible in 2 Kings chapter 23. So just write that reference down, and you can read about that battle later this afternoon. Now, the battle in 2 Kings 23 at the place called Har Megiddo was a battle between King Josiah of Judah and King Necho of Egypt. Now, this was a significant battle because Judah was defeated in this battle. The Egyptian forces managed to overpower those of Judah. They lost the battle, and this was the beginning, historically, of their decline as a nation. That battle, won by the king of Egypt, set Judah into decline to the point where it became captured eventually by the Babylonians, and the people of Judah were taken off into captivity. And there are many books in the Bible which describe that experience. This was a dark time for God's ancient people. So what is John getting at here? I think the name suggests something very important. And the fact that Judah went into captivity as a result of this battle suggests that there is going to be a great reversal that occurs at the end of time. In other words, the new Babylon, which for John was Rome, is going to be judged in the very place where the old Babylon conquered and took Judah away into captivity. So this name, Har Megiddo, stands for an event. I believe the last resistance of Antichrist forces against the rule of Jesus Christ before Jesus Christ breaks through the clouds and brings in a new creation. Now when you get to chapter 19, this battle is described, and, and to be frank, and we'll, we'll get there in a few weeks' time, but to be frank, it's not much of a battle. Like all the kings are gathered together for battle. It's the great battle of the day of God. And they're ready to fight. And you know what happens? There's no battle. Jesus shows up and boom, they're gone. Just like that. Because Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And nothing can do battle against him. Now, bowl number seven. Found in verses 17 through 21. It is a bowl that is poured into the air. The seventh angel poured his bowl into the air. And here's a key line. Out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne. A loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. It's finished. Accomplished. That is, the wrath of God has now come in its full. 
And from verse 17 through 21, we have a picture of total judge, judge, judgment. Verse 18, then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. Now, how bad was it? No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. Did you see the pictures on television of the Indonesians in Aceh province when that earthquake came just about a week and a half back? How people were running into the sheer look of terror on their faces because they were thinking 2004, the tsunami? Now picture that a thousandfold more. This is the worst earthquake that will ever happen in history. In other words, the world is about to collapse. That's what John is saying. It's a picture of the end. And it's a terrifying one. Verse 19, the great city split into three parts. The cities of the nations collapsed. It's universal. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away. And the mountains could not be found. Imagine the, the Himalayas and the, the Alps and the Rockies. No more. Just literally in a moment of time, they are obliterated. You can't find them anymore. From the sky, huge hailstones of about 100 pounds fell, each fell upon men. And they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. And they cursed again. There is no repentance. Only, only further cursing of God. Okay, let's stop now. Let me make my wrap-up points. What does all of this then mean for us today? Or to put it in another way, what does the reality, what reality is being conveyed to us in the imagery of these verses? And I want to share with you five judgment truths to conclude today. Five judgment truths. Number one. Judgment is horrible. Judgment is horrible. The awful imagery of this text makes it clear. John wants you and I, the readers of this vision, he wants us to feel the horror of the wrath of God. It is total. It's not one quarter. It's not one third. It's total. It's horrible. Number two, judgment is justified. That's what happens, or that's what's said in verse 6. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. Last line, as they deserve. As they deserve. Friends, the world deserves this. We all deserve this. God's judgment is not capricious. It's not arbitrary. It is earned. It is chosen. I quote Packer again. Nobody stands under the wrath of God except those who have chosen to do so. And they have chosen to do so. And many of you have chosen to do so through your accumulated choices to not follow Jesus Christ. Judgment is horrible. Judgment is justified. Number three, judgment comes only after there has been sufficient time for repentance. Chapter 16, verse 9. But they refuse to repent and glorify him. Verse 11. And they cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. And so the trumpets were given as warnings, and now the bores, the bowls are poured out. Listen. God always gives ample opportunity for people to repent and believe. He always does. That's who he is. That's his nature. This truth, truth three, is underscored in chapter three of Second Peter. Peter begins chapter 3 by saying, in the last days, there will be many who come, and, and he calls them scoffers. And they scoff at this truth. And they're going to say, judgment? you got to be kidding me. Where is the promise of the judgment of God? 
You Christians have been saying now for so many years that Jesus is coming to judge the world. Well, where is the fulfillment of that promise? Where is the coming of Jesus? It hasn't happened yet. All things have continued from the beginning of creation right until now. We have never seen the judgment of God. It ain't going to happen. It's a myth, and you're an idiot to believe in it. And Peter, in 2 Peter 3 says, there's a reason why it hasn't happened yet. And the reason why it hasn't happened yet is not because it's a myth, not because it's not true. It hasn't happened yet because Peter says, God is patient. Very patient. And he is extending the life of humanity because he is giving to every person an opportunity to repent. And God says, he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But this day is coming. It will come as sure as there is a God in heaven. God's patience will one day come to an end and God will judge the world. Number four, the judgment always fits the crime. Chapter 16, verse 6 says, They shed blood and they get blood in return. That's just simply telling us that the judgment fits the crime. It's what the Old Testament law established. An eye for an eye. A hand for a hand. And I want to say this to you today. Listen. You can trust the holy God in this truth. His judgment is always consistent with the sin that is being committed. Number five, our last point, the most important one. God's judgment is just. It is perfectly just. I want you to notice chapter 16, verse 7. In chapter 16, verse 7, the altar responds. Now, what are they responding to? Well, verse 5. The angel in charge of the water says, You are just in these judgments. You who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. And I heard the altar respond. Now, what, 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 what do you mean John's hearing an altar? An altar is a, is a piece of furniture. It's like this table. What do you mean the altar responds? Well, it's not the altar per se. It's what's underneath the altar. And in chapter 6, what did we see underneath the altar? God's people, God's saints who had been butchered and martyred for the cause of Christ. And they're the ones who cry out, Your judgments are just. And they are true. They are true. God's judgment is just because God's judgment is absolutely fair. And God's judgment is is just because God is absolutely merciful. And some of you say, merciful? Like, this isn't mercy here. Let me say that again. God's judgments are just because God is absolutely merciful. Merciful? God's judgment is mercifully just because God, who will judge the world, has provided a way out of that judgment. Now, there's two verses I want you to consider with me right here in this text. And now we end with the gospel. We end with the good news. Look at chapter 15, verse 1. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. Do you see that? With them God's wrath is completed, literally finished. It's done. It's finished. That's merciful. Now look at chapter 16, verse 7. I'm sorry, chapter 16, verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. It is done. Now, it is done and it is completed means the same thing. It means it is finished. It's absolutely finished. Now, now where, where does this voice come from that says it is done? 
It says it comes from an angel, in, or it comes from, from the throne. Who's saying it is done? God. God is saying, my judgment, my wrath is now completely finished. It is completely done. Now, I want to ask you this. Now, think with me. Is there any other place in the Bible where terminology like that on the screen and in our Bibles, in these two texts, where that kind of terminology, that kind of word is found? Where? At the cross. At the cross. Now, here's the actual verse. It's found in John's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 30, and it says this, knowing that all was now completed, knowing that all was, who knew that it was all completed? Jesus. Jesus, knowing that it was all now completed, said what? It is finished. And then John records, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. So what exactly was finished? What exactly was completed? We know what's completed in chapter 15 and 16 of, Rev of Revelation. What is complete is, is that day in the future when God is going to pour out his full judgment on the world. It will finally come to an end. It will be completed in its entirety. Ha hallelujah. It will happen. But what was completed what was finished 2,000 years ago when Jesus said, it is finished? Friends, everything was completed. Everything that needs to be done to take you and I, unholy sinners, and reconcile us to a holy God was completed. It was finished. Everything about God judging sin was finished at the cross. And what was finished in the cross was the judgment of every single individual who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Your sin, your judgment, my sin, my judgment, it was all completed at the cross in the person of Jesus Christ. At the cross, God's holy, perfect, true, just, and deserved judgment was poured out in its entirety upon one who became a substitute for every individual who would believe in him. At the cross 2,000 years ago, God's burning zeal for right, coupled with his perfect hatred for evil, came together in a moment in time, and it came together for the reason, the purpose of saving sinners. Saving us from what? Saving me from what? Saving me from the just wrath of a holy God. Hallelujah. So the way out of wrath, the way to escape the judgment of God is to throw yourself at the cross of Jesus Christ because it was at the cross where wrath was mercifully expended by God on himself in the person of Jesus and so that voice, which will one day in time come from the throne and say in the future, it is finished, is the same voice that came from the man on the cross when he said, it is finished. And so I stand before you today as one who is completely free of the wrath of God. I have no fear of the judgment of God because I'm better than you? Better? No. 
if God were to judge me justly, I would be damned forever. I'd be damned forever. Because that's what my sins deserve. But God in Jesus has taken all of my sin and he sacrificed his son who received the wrath on my behalf. And so I am free. And you can be free too if you put your trust in Jesus.